real, okay? I just want to let you guys know, okay? We will be back in November with more episodes. I'm sorry, yes. We gotta recharge the screens. They're on low power mode right now, okay? <laughs> so tonight, we are talking about the real life inspiration for the show Cops. Cops. Now, <laughs> this year marks a grim anniversary of three infamous deaths at the hands of the police. Five years ago today, Michael Brown, an unarmed black man, was fatally shot during a scuffle with a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. Van Dyke, who is white, shot 17-year-old Laquan McDonald five years ago. Five years since Eric Garner's death. Five years since he was pulled to the ground by a police officer. These killings put a spotlight on the ways police often target and terrorize communities of color. And our country is still grappling with the consequences. Think of all the things we've seen in the past five years. I Can't Breathe, Kaepernick, Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, Jay-Z and the NFL, and the best episode of Blackish. That episode was really good. <laughs> now, a lot of these protests were productive, but some weren't. Racism solved. <laughs> that's not an ad for Pepsi. That's an ad for being a rich white girl. <laughs> now look, I gotta be real, okay? As a Muslim, I'm afraid of a lot of things. The FBI, the CIA, the NSA, TSA, <laughs> ICE. Basically, if your agency ends in a vowel, I'm scared of you. <laughs> so look, I can empathize with the fear and the anxiety around law enforcement. But when it comes to police brutality, I can't really speak to that. I mean, when the cops see me, they think I own a hookah bar. And the thing is, <laughs> I do own a hookah bar, but they don't know that. Stop profiling me, all right? So on the anniversary of these killings, I wanna focus on something that hasn't gotten as much coverage. The system that has allowed this to happen. Because this problem is so much bigger than individual bad cops. There is a separate legal and political framework that shields cops from consequences, gives them special rights when defending themselves, and often trains them to fear the communities that they're supposed to protect. And look, you might be like, Hassan, what do you know about police? You're just a Bollywood bitch who does PowerPoint. <laughs> and I can't argue with that. It was on the cover of Variety. It said that right there, all right? So I can't speak to that, but I do know someone who A, isn't a Bollywood bitch, and B knows a lot about policing, starting with how cops are trained. My name is Seth Stoughton. I'm a law professor. I was a city cop for five years, a state investigator for two and a half years. How well are police officers trained in this country? American police officers are some of the best trained in the world, but what they're trained to do is part of the problem. What are they trained to do? You need to stay on your guard all the time, because as soon as you're not, someone's gonna take advantage of that, and you could die as a result. And it's not just complacency. It's also hesitation. You not only have to be on your guard, you have to be ready to act instantly. Not react, but act. Sometimes even before a threat fully manifests. You have to act instantly. New cops are taught to see the people around them as potential threats. And it's made worse by the fact that police departments typically spend eight hours training officers in conflict de-escalation in 129 hours training them in weapons and fighting. That can't be the right ratio. Think about it, imagine if pilots spent 94% of their training going down the emergency slide. <laughs> They're like, look, just in case this definitely happens, we got a slide. <laughs> and while I didn't want that much police training, I did want to try a little. Well, here's a simple drill, one that I did in the police academy and at my police agency. Uh, you're gonna be the officer, make a finger gun. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. You want me to do this? Yep, I'm gonna be your suspect. Your job is to stop me from shooting you by pointing my finger gun and saying bang. And the way that you're gonna do that is by shooting me by saying bang with your finger gun, okay? Okay. I'm standing here, I'm sitting here, you don't know what I have, right? Yes. Bang. <laughs> you just died. Okay, this is how we're learning how to police finger gun games? This is how we're learning to not hesitate. Do you know what this reminds me of? Remember this one? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not unlike slaps, Bang. right? If I, yeah. 
the principles are about the same. I have to anticipate your action. I have to react. Bang. Even before. Dude, come on. Bang. Bang. No, nope, I got you. Bro, I got you. You're proving the point. Action is faster than reaction. I had two reaction. guns. You did. You did. You did. Killing me. Bang. Come on, bro. Step your game up. Bang. Bang. That was a sigh of respect. He respects me. Now, I know finger banging may seem fun, but guys, <laughs> fear-based training can go way too far. As you'll find out from former West Point professor Dave Grossman. Now, he teaches classes in something called warrior policing to thousands of law enforcement officers. This is a real ad for a seminar. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Who taught Rudy Giuliani iMovie? <laughs> now, Dave Grossman's main move is telling cops that they are natural born killers. You fight violence. What do you fight it with? Superior violence. Righteous violence, eh? Violence is your tool. Violence is your enemy. Violence is the realm we operate in. You are men and women of violence. If you properly prepare yourself, killing is just not that big a deal. It's just not that big a deal. How is Dave Grossman not a suspect in every murder? <laughs> There's so many unsolved homicides in the country, and he's just walking around like killing people is 100% normal. <laughs> By the way, if you think his seminar was rough, just listen to this guy talk fashion. Have you heard me talk about the necktie? The necktie has been in fashion for over 100 years. Okay. Um, it's a dip. Just quite frankly, it starts down here, it comes up here, it's got a big knob on it. It's a freaking dip. For the last hundred years, we've all been wearing dips. If future generations will look at photographs of our children with their tie on, elders of the church with their tie on, say they all got a dick on. They got a freaking dick. Okay. What does his dick look like? He's like, it's a dick! You know, 14 inches long, made of cotton, loops around your neck. It's just a regular dick. Now, here's why we're talking about Grossman. Even though he's never killed anyone, at least one of his students has. Officer Geronimo Yanez was a cop in Minneapolis who took a Grossman seminar just two years before this happened. The dash cam video shows Officer Geronimo Yanez asking Philando Castile for his license and registration. Castile calmly explains he is armed. The 29-year-old officer fired seven shots within 90 seconds of making the stop. Now, obviously, Grossman can't be directly blamed for the death of Philando Castile. There are a lot of factors at play. Because outside of fear-based training, there's another structural problem with policing. Lack of consequences. After they're trained, cops get to play by a completely different set of rules than everyone else. And you might be like, well, yeah, police should have different rules. They're in the line of fire. I hear that. But some of these rules have gone way too far. Did you know it's almost impossible to sue a cop? I know, this is America. We love suing people. <laughs> That's why to become a US citizen, they ask you which one is Salino and which one is Barnes. <laughs> They'll be like, sing the song, and you're like, all right, 1-800-8888-8888. And they're like, congratulations, you're a citizen. <laughs> but you can't really win a lawsuit against law enforcement. I'm serious. Because every single cop in the country is protected by a legal concept called qualified immunity. Now, normally, when you sue a civilian, you have to prove that that person violated your rights. But when you sue a cop, you have to prove they violated a right that was clearly established. But a right isn't considered clearly established until someone successfully sues a cop for violating it. It's the police version of trying to get your first job. <laughs> Remember, like, you go in, you're like, how do I get my job? And they're like, you need previous experience. <laughs> but you can't get experience without having a job. <laughs> and you're like, damn it, just let me work at the White House. Why can't I be Secretary of Energy? Just let me do it. <laughs> this is something the Corbett family found out the hard way. 
Coffee County Sheriff says his deputy is upset about the shooting that injured a 10-year-old boy. Deputy Michael Vickers accidentally shot 10-year-old Dakota Corbett in his yard on Burton Road. Vickers was trying to shoot at a dog in the yard and accidentally hit Corbett in the leg. Now, obviously, the Corbett family tried suing, but a federal court threw out the lawsuit because there's never been a previous case where a cop was trying to shoot a dog and then hit a 10-year-old kid. Because when somebody shoots someone, they're not like, oh, my bad, dude. I was just trying to kill your dog. <laughs> that wouldn't get you out of trouble. That would get you murdered by John Wick. <laughs> now, qualified immunity basically means you can get away with anything as long as you're original. Like the cop comes in, he's like, hey, you planted cocaine on the suspect, but you did it like Salt Bay. I've never seen that before, so you're free to go. <laughs> Now, even if cops do face consequences, there are often rules in place to ensure that no one ever hears about it. Now, this is true. In about half of US states, police get to keep records of misconduct confidential, which makes no sense. Think about it, if a doctor commits malpractice, you can look that up. If a lawyer fabricates evidence, they get disbarred. If Lil Yachty records the theme song for Chef Boyardee, it's on the internet forever. <laughs> Chef, Chef Boyardee. Goodness. Broccoli is how he pays the bills, but beefaroni is Yachty's passion. <laughs> By the way, that white dude bobbing his head, that's Donny Osmond. <laughs> the point is, there is no national database on police misconduct, which is crazy. We monitor everything. We know Channing Tatum's sleep schedule for the past five years. Now, that's not a government database. That's just something I've been tracking. <laughs> Channing has sleep apnea. I'm worried. <laughs> Now, even when states try to make police records accessible, cops find ways around it, which we're seeing right now in California. The state legislature recently passed a law that unsealed police records, and cops aren't having it. Inglewood City Council approved the action to destroy more than 100 police shooting and other investigation records. Inglewood Mayor James Butts tells us that the decision to throw out these old records has nothing to do with hiding any wrongdoing. These records were sitting in a storehouse um, just gathering dust, taking up space. Some went back as far as 1991. Yeah, Marie Kondo that shit. <laughs> it's not like there was police misconduct in Southern California in 1991. <laughs> the guy's like, look, we don't have any records before then. They burned up in a riot, but I don't know what that was about. <laughs> now, qualified immunity and confidential records are big problems. But we can't talk about a system that can incentivize bad behavior without talking about police unions. Now, for the record, I'm not anti-union. I love unions. I'm in a union. They paid for my hair plugs. <laughs> but the problem is that police unions don't just work to get cops better pay. Many police union contracts shield bad cops from legal consequences. How are police unions blocking reform? Oh, my God. How are they not blocking reform? The collective bargaining agreements that they engage with at individual police agencies will often have provisions relating to police discipline. It may limit how officers are investigated. It may limit how officers are disciplined. It may require that an officer's disciplinary records be cleared every 60 days. That means there's no history even when an officer is engaged in misconduct repeatedly. Cops are treating misconduct like it's their browser history and they can hear mom running up the stairs. They're like, oh, she's gonna investigate, clear cookies and cash. Your mom comes up and she's like, wow, apparently you've only been looking at Google homepage. And you're like, yeah, mom, I just, I love clean minimalism. That's what tons of cops get to do with their records. And many police contracts go way beyond that. Like in Chicago. After police shot and killed Laquan McDonald, their union deal gave officers 24 hours before needing to say anything after the shooting. The contract itself institutionalizes these private understandings among police officers that make it harder to identify and root out bad behavior. If we allow a lot of time to pass after something happens, and if we allow people to talk to one another about it, Worst case scenario is that time period basically gives them an opportunity to concoct 
and to collude. They get a day to put their story together. And remember, this is built into police contracts, and some cops seem to be getting the message that they can act without consequence. A recent study found that when deputies in Florida got union contracts, violent misconduct complaints went up 40%. You only see that kind of spike in violence when you tell Russell Crowe to put his phone away. <laughs> and if these special rights don't make it into cops' union contracts, they can be put into law with something called a law enforcement officer's bill of rights, which I know, it sounds like it was written by the Fox News founding fathers. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that room. Their declaration was like, just so you know, only men are created equal. Hannity's like, Article 2, you can still be weird to interns. <laughs> We're like, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good one. But a law enforcement bill of rights is essentially the protections of a union contract in the form of a state law. Police unions have worked with at least 16 states to pass officer bill of rights laws. And they come with some jarring provisions. So after a critical incident like a police shooting, a uh, Bill of Rights might say that the officer has the right to review certain evidence, including potentially statements by other witnesses or video recordings of the incident. Wait, so if they get to review the tape in a proceeding, I get to review the tape too, right? No. So let me get this straight. A police officer is under investigation. Before making a statement, they can say, hey, can I look at the tape first? They can make a demand. And then they watch the game tape and then make their statement? Yes. That's like cheating, though. It can be. Whoa, 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 wait, no, no, no. But Seth, even in the NFL, when the refs are reviewing the tape, everyone in the stadium can also see the replay. That's why there's the big-ass boo when they call it. <laughs> yeah, that's not the case in policing. Unions don't tend to see it as their job to create positive policing. They tend to see it as their job to protect their current members. The thing is, he's right. Police unions stand by bad cops because they have to. It's a union's job to protect their members. But sometimes, protection becomes obstruction. Police unions have gotten paid leave for cops who kill, made it impossible to investigate anonymous claims against cops, and protected the identities of violent officers. Now that is a strong union. Meanwhile, teachers' unions are making dry erase markers out of blood and twigs. <laughs> Step your game up, teachers. Now, with all those forces in place, no wonder police misconduct doesn't get properly investigated. Professor Michael Eric Dyson is an author who has studied this issue extensively. So I asked him about police accountability. Who should be dialing it up or down when it comes to the enforcement on police officers? I mean, it's got to be the prosecutors, right? Uh, the prosecutors are the ones who determine whether or not a police person is held to account for whatever offense or infraction. But prosecutors depend upon the police, and as a result of that, they can't hold them to account. So it's a kind of collusion. If I don't have his back or her back, the next time around, they won't have my back. It makes no sense. Prosecutors are the ones who charge cops with crimes. But they also need cops for investigations, to produce witnesses, and to testify themselves. They're basically co-workers. Like, imagine doing that shit at work, right? You drop an email, you're like, hey, Pam, you're going to prison, motherfucker. <laughs> also, looping in Carol, who says we need more desserts for the potluck. <laughs> Cheers. Don't you hate it? Like, when you get a passive-aggressive email, and they're like, hey, are you going to work this weekend? Cheers. You're like, don't fucking cheers me. <laughs> now, obviously, prosecutors are going to think twice before charging cops. So guess what happens? No criminal charges for the deadly police shooting of an unarmed man. No federal charges in the deadly police shooting. Prosecutors say they will not charge four Wilmington police officers. Declined to bring charges. No criminal charges. Dropped all charges. No charges. No charges. Would not file criminal charges in another officer-involved shooting. I feel like the phrase no criminal charges is just part of the local news now. They're like, welcome to WPXI, Channel 11. You're home for no criminal charges. Now to Al with weather and no criminal charges. Let's go to Frank on sports. Frank, you charged up about the LA Chargers and no criminal charges? I sure am. <laughs> now, this one really hits home for me. Because last year in Sacramento, the town where I grew up, there was a blockbuster case of police and prosecutors getting freaky. 
Sacramento's top prosecutor is facing questions about donations from law enforcement just days after the Stephon Clark shooting. District Attorney Ann Marie Schubert will decide whether to file charges against the two officers who shot and killed the unarmed 22-year-old. She received a total of $13,000 in campaign donations from two police unions within a week of the shooting. You gave the DA thousands of dollars within a week? Come on, before you bribe the DA, you gotta wait at least 10 days. <laughs> Otherwise, you seem thirsty. <laughs> oh, and you probably guessed, later on, that DA made the local news by bringing no criminal charges. <laughs> now, between police unions, their contracts, bills of rights, and relationships with prosecutors, cops often operate in a world of their own. Now, the good news is that some people are actually working to change that. Just this year, in the wake of Philando Castile's death, the city of Minneapolis banned warrior training. Remember Dick Tie Guy? <laughs> that guy's banned, which is good. But the police union wasn't too happy about it. Lieutenant Bob Kroll, head of the police union, says he understands the city can deny paying for or compensating officers for certain types of training, but he says they can't control officers on their own time, which is why the union partnered with law officer training to offer free warrior-style training to any officer who wants it. What happens if one set of training teaches you principles that are in direct conflict with another set of training? we'd have to look at what specific part of the curriculum is in violation. Are you encouraging officers to openly violate that? If they're on their own time and they want to attend it, I'm going to encourage officers to do it. I myself will be the first one to do it. If I would be disciplined, it would never be upheld. They couldn't punish him if they wanted to. That union boss just did our whole episode in 20 seconds. Also, that cop has a Scarface poster, which, okay. Except that he has a second Scarface poster. <laughs> Did he not see the movie? Scarface doesn't like the cops. It'd be like if Michael Vick's favorite movie was Air Bud. Why would he like that movie? It's about basketball. Now, fear-based policing is the exact type of training we don't need anymore. That's true everywhere in America, but nowhere more than where we started tonight's discussion, in communities of color. Because when you have hair trigger cops in a culture that often sees one type of person as a constant threat, what do you think is gonna happen? Well, down in Ferguson, the Justice Department answered that question. A blistering report alleged a pattern of racial bias among Ferguson's authorities. That the city's mostly white police department unfairly targets black residents. 21,000 people who live in Ferguson. There are 16,000 people who have outstanding arrest warrants, and most of these are for very minor offenses. Out of 21,000 residents, 16,000 had arrest warrants. That is 76% of the population. And what's completely unsurprising... 96% of those people were black. And the other 4% were just white guys named Lucius. <laughs> They're just like, oh, clerical error. <laughs> now, you don't get to those kind of numbers because of a few bad apples. This was only possible because of an entire system. What does America need to understand that communities of color are experiencing on the ground every day when it comes to police? Black and brown people don't hate the police. They hate bad cops. The culture of policing in this country is so defensive that it refuses to acknowledge there's some things we can do wrong. It's the culture that defends the cop for doing the wrong thing against the black or brown person that got killed. Even when you got it in broad daylight and you got it on a digital recording and for God's sake, everybody with any rational capacity can see what's going on. Those are the kind of issues that need to be addressed. Black people are not anti-police, they're anti-bad cops. All people should be anti-bad cop not anti-police. But that means reforming problems like overprotective unions, special legal protections, and fear-based training. Because if cops are gonna be held to a different standard, it should be a higher one. Seth Stoughton taught me that, and I wanted to show my gratitude. Seth, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this stuff, because these issues don't just affect individuals. They affect entire communities. Bang. <laughs> Still got it.